Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today it is time to do my October Book of the Month predictions. <music> All right, everybody, it is time once again to do my book of the month predictions, this time for the month of October. Now, full transparency, I feel a bit unprepared. I'm like Santa Claus with the list that I make for these predictions, right? I'm making the list, I'm checking it twice, maybe even three times to make sure that everything's on there that I wanna be on there, removing things that maybe I've changed my mind about, but I made this list early on in the month of September. I haven't checked it again, I haven't changed it at all, and quite honestly, I have completely forgotten almost everything that I put on this list. So this is going to be just as much of a surprise to me as it is to you. I honestly feel so behind on basically every single aspect of my life at this moment but I am hoping that because I didn't prepare as much that maybe I'm going to get more lucky than I have been the past couple of months and maybe get more things right. That's what we're gonna go with but I actually do have quite a substantial list of predictions for you today. Just as a reminder I break up all my predictions into five distinct genre categories but I'm only allowed to give up to 20 predictions throughout all of the categories and I think I have close to 20 this time so we're almost close to maxing out the number of predictions that I can give in a video. As per usual, we are going to start off this video with the mystery thriller horror category and the very first book that I have for you today is a book called The Book of Witching by C.J. Cook. This says Clem gets a call that is every mother's worst nightmare. Her 19 year old daughter Erin is unconscious in the hospital after a hiking trip with her friends on the remote Orkney Islands that met a horrifying end, leaving her boyfriend dead and her best friend missing. When Erin wakes, she doesn't recognize her mother and she doesn't answer to her name but insists she is someone named Nix. Clem travels the site of her daughter's accident determined to find out what happened to her. The answer may lie in a dark secret in the history of the Orkneys, a woman wrongly accused of witchcraft and murder four centuries ago. Clem begins to wonder if Aaron's strange behavior is a symptom of a broken mind or the effects of an ancient curse. So that absolutely sounds phenomenal and that's giving you all the vibes that you were really looking for in October, right? You definitely have the witchiness here. It is possible that a woman's daughter has been maybe possessed by the spirit of this woman that was accused of witchcraft back in the day. I'm not sure but I'm really digging the vibes. I've never read anything by this author CJ Cook but this is certainly one that I have put on my TBR so whether or not it is featured on Book of the Month, I think I'm gonna go ahead and give this a shot, but I would love to see this featured on Book of the Month in October. This next book is called No One Will Know from Rose Carlyle. Now, Rose Carlyle's other book, I believe it was called The Girl in the Mirror, was featured previously on Book of the Month. And so because she was featured previously, I think she has a higher likelihood of being featured again. So that is why I wanted to go ahead and mention this here. This says, Julia and Christopher Highgate have the picture-perfect life, gobs of money thanks to their lucrative shipping enterprise and an estate on a secluded island. When they meet Eve Sylvester, they know she is the exact person they should hire to be their child's nanny. Eve doesn't have any living relatives, she's lost touch with her friends, and her partner is out of the picture. Best of all, she's expecting a baby. Eve thinks she's landed the greatest gig. Previously desperate and penniless, now she'll live like a queen and have a promising future for her daughter. But the job seems too good to be true. Why would the Highgates hire Eve if she has no prior nannying experience? Why must Eve stay out of sight? And what's with the mysterious yachts coming in and out of the Highgates' private marina? It's too late to ask questions, though. Eve is already in far too deep. Set against the backdrop of a remote island, an endless stream of secrets, and unbelievable wealth, No One Will Know is a propulsive seductive novel of suspense that shows the terrible consequences of shocking grief, staggering lies, and fatal mistakes. So again, I primarily feature this because Rose Carlisle has been featured on Book of the Month in the past, but this definitely does contain other tropes that I feel like Book of the Month does enjoy featuring. We have a remote setting, this time on a remote island. We all know that Book of the Month loves featuring their tropical locations, their remote tropical locations, and this is going to have that. This also has wealthy people behaving badly. So all of these things combined, I do think that this is a strong contender for this category for the month of October. Now this next one is by an author that to my knowledge has never been featured on Book of the Month in the past. She's actually an author that I've never heard of before researching this video, but I was intrigued by the synopsis of this one. And this is certainly one that I would like to see featured on Book of the Month. And we all know that they don't necessarily shy away from featuring authors that have previously published books. I cannot rule this one out. And like I said, I really like the synopsis of this and the vibes. So I definitely wanted to feature it here. It's a book called Every Moment Since by Mary Beth Mayhew Whalen. Everyone in Why Not North Carolina knows the name Davy Melkor, knows the video clip of him juggling four balls all at the very same time, knows the Marty McFly jacket his mother made for his birthday that he wore proudly and often, but no one knows what happened to him the night he went missing more than 20 years ago. When the jacket is unexpectedly uncovered, the cold case reporters and Davy's family is thrust into yet another media storm. But at the heart of the story are four people forever changed by one single night. Thaddeus Melkor, Davy's older brother, created the life of his dreams by writing a best-selling memoir about his family's experience 
experience and is enjoying success and notoriety as a result, even if the memoir doesn't quite reveal the whole story. Tabitha Malcor, his mother, is divorced and living alone, advocating for victims' rights and faithfully cataloging her regrets each week, never including her biggest regret of all. Anissa Weaver was just a kid herself when Davey went missing, and her connection to him is one she cannot reveal as she serves as the Malcor family's public information officer. And long suspected in Davey's disappearance, Gordon Swift has kept his head down and scraped together a decent life. But the new attention to the case makes it impossible to hide from the public and the past. With hauntingly vivid prose, Mary Beth Mayhew Whalen peels back the curtain on the inner turmoil of those who were left behind in the small southern community as they pick up the pieces that remains and press forward into the light to find hope and healing. So what I really like about the synopsis of this story is that it is going to examine people who were deeply affected by the disappearance of this boy 20 years ago. Nobody knows what happened to this boy and so you're following these people who were involved in this somehow. You're going to follow all of those perspectives and what the aftermath was like for them and so I'm really intrigued by this but I'm also wanting to know if we were actually going to figure out what happened. Is this going to be a case where the mystery is solved or is this really more of a character driven narrative that focuses more on these people and what their life went through. I'm not sure but either way I am very very intrigued. Like I said I have never heard of this author before but if I read this one and enjoy it I definitely think I would like to look into her backlist. And the last one that I have for this category is not one that I really have much investment in but of course I had to feature it just because it's going to be set in a tropical location this time Thailand. The book is called The Trip by Phoebe Morgan. It just says four friends are on the vacation of a lifetime in Thailand until a vicious murder shatters their paradise. Four friends who would do anything for each other until now. Only one of them committed a crime, but all four know how to keep a secret and they're all guilty of something. So again, you have friends going on a vacation to a tropical location. Somebody's going to die. They're all carrying secrets. I don't know. This sounds very Ruth Ware-esque and I do think that it's highly possible that Book of the Month would feature this book. All right, moving on into the romance category, we actually have the newest release from Erin Sterling coming out called The Wedding Witch. Now this is actually the third in the Grave Glen series and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Book of the Month has featured the other two. I highly think that they would feature this one. This one is a holiday related romance though. It is possible that they might release it as an add-on closer to the holiday season. That's what they did last year with A Winter in New York by Josie Silver. I think that one was released in October, but they added it in December. I wouldn't be surprised if they did something like that with this. I'm just going to read this blurb here. It says, The New York Times bestselling author of The X-Hex and The Kiss Curse brightens up the winter solstice with another delightfully spooky novel following Bowen Penhowell and the girl he feels strangely drawn to, especially when she becomes his only hope of salvation after a strong spell sends them to a Yuletide celebration more than 50 years in the past. So if you enjoy Aaron Sterling, if you have read the other two books in this series, this is definitely one to keep your eye out for on Book of the Month in October. Another witchy related romance that is coming out in October is a book called Best Hex Ever by Nadia L. Fossey. It says, as a skilled kitchen witch, Dina Whitlock knows her way around a pastry recipe. In fact, she runs her very own London cafe, serving magic-infused treats to her loyal customers. She is not as much of an expert on romance thanks to the hex hanging over her head. It's hard to fall in love when your partner is cursed with a string of bad luck. But who needs love when your best friend is getting married? Scott Mason has returned from global travels, thrilled to embark on his new role as a curator at the British Museum. Having left London two years ago to recover from a devastating breakup, Scott has missed out on a lot. With his best friend's wedding approaching and Scott as best man, this is his chance to make up for lost time. Little does he expect to be enchanted by the magical maid of honor. During a romantic weekend filled with a peculiar hedge maze, palm readings by candlelight, and a midnight Halloween ritual, there's no denying the chemistry between them. But the hex still holds, and Dina knows that Scott is in danger of more than just bad luck because he's falling hard. Will Dina be able to undo the hex before it's too late? So this just sounds like it's going to be a cute, sweet, witchy kind of romance. Book of the Month is no stranger to featuring books of this type with these tropes. So that is why I wanted to mention it here for this category. And then the last one that I have for this category is a book called Catch and Keep by Erin Hahn. It says at 33, Marion Laughlin's just turned down her boyfriend's proposal, walked away from her decade-long position as a park ranger, and returned to her childhood playground in northern Wisconsin to accept her inheritance, a decrepit waterfront bait shop. After a lifetime of letting things happen to her, she's ready to start making her own moves, even if everyone else thinks she's making the wrong ones. Well, not everyone. At least the local heart stopper and resort owner is on her side. Josiah Cole has made some missteps in his life, but he's proud of what he has. Two awesome kids and keys to the kind of getaway spot that has families coming back every summer. After his marriage to Dissolves, leaving him a single dad, he feels he is the last person to judge Marin for her recent transformation, even if his best friend, her brother, wants him to feel otherwise. Besides, he genuinely likes having her around. She's a breath of fresh air, his kids adore her, not to mention her dog Rogers, and it doesn't hurt that she's beautiful. Things between Marin and Joe are easy. So easy, they're fully immersed in the middle before they even decide to begin. It's not a question of should they, but rather, can they make it last? Are things too easy, or is this just how real love works? In Aaron Hahn's heartwarmingly sexy catch and keep, Marin and Joe have to be brave enough to find out. Okay, so that sounds cute. We have a female 
main character who is definitely in transition. She's left her boyfriend, she's left her job, she's going back home to inherit this bait shop, which it sounds like she's going to like get up and running again. And everybody's questioning her decisions except for Josiah. And Josiah himself is in a little bit of a turmoil. His marriage has fallen apart. He is a single dad, but he owns and runs this resort. And he is kind of in support of Marin's decisions. And it sounds like they are going to get together. And it sounds absolutely cute and wonderful. And just like the type of thing that book of the month would feature. All right, moving on into the contemporary slash literary fiction category, we have yet another witchy book and it's called The Woodsmoke Women's Book of Spells by Rachel Greenlaw. Carrie Morgan ran from Woodsmoke 10 years ago and the decision has haunted her ever since. Spending a decade painting and drifting around Europe, she tries to forget her family's legacy and the friends she left behind. But the Morgan women have always been able to harness the power of the mountains surrounding the town and their spells and curses are sewn into the soil. The mountains, they say, never forget. Sure enough, when Carrie's grandmother dies and leaves behind her dilapidated cottage, she returns to renovate, certain she will only be there for one winter. She meets Matthew as the temperature dips, a newcomer who offers to help refurbish the cottage. Before long, and despite warnings from her great aunt, Cora, of the old stories, Carrie finds herself falling for the charming stranger. But when the frost thaws in spring, Matthew goes missing. Carrie's convinced he's real and he's in danger. As she fights her way across the mountains to find him, she must confront all the reasons why she left Woodsmoke and decide whether the place she spent the last decade running from is the home she's been searching for. I love the vibes of it. In some ways, I am getting a little bit of wayward vibes by Amelia Hart. I'm not entirely sure if it's spot on to that. Or also, it sounds a little bit maybe like Adrian Young, like a little bit more on the serious side. Like Adrian Young were definitely speculative fiction with a romantic element to it, but that wasn't necessarily the whole main point of the story. So this is giving me a little bit of those vibes and I am certainly here for it. All right, next we actually have a repeat author. It's the newest release from Louise Erdrich called The Mighty Red. And this synopsis is actually pretty long. So I'm just going to read this final paragraph here. It says, The Mighty Red is a novel of tender humor, disturbance and hallucinatory mourning. It is about on the job pains and immeasurable satisfactions, a turbulent landscape and eating the native weed growing in your backyard. It is about ordinary people who dream, grow up, fall in love, struggle, endure tragedy, carry bitter secrets. Men and women both complicated and contradictory, flawed and decent, lonely and hopeful. It is about a starkly beautiful prairie community whose members must cope with devastating consequences as powerful forces upend them. As with every book, this great modern master writes, The Mighty Red is about our tattered bond with the earth and about love and all of its absurdity and splendor. So yes, this is definitely on the literary fiction side. It sounds like it's going to be very, very character driven. I've never read anything from Louise Erdrich before, but I do know that she has been featured on book of the month. And so if you have read her and have enjoyed her in the past, this might be one that you want to check out if they feature it. All right, next we have a book called Love Can't Feed You by Cherry Lou Sky. After a harrowing flight, Queenie, her younger brother, and their elderly Chinese father arrive in the United States from the Philippines. They're here to finally reunite with Queenie's Filipina mother who has been working as a nurse in Brooklyn for the past few years, building a life that everyone hopes will set them up for better prospects. But her mother is not the same woman she was in the Philippines. Something in her face is different, almost hardened, and she seems so American already. Queenie on the cusp of adulthood has big dreams of attending college, of spending her days immersed in the pages of books, but there is not enough money for her and her brother to both be in school. So first she must work. Queenie rotates through jobs and settles tentatively into her new life, but her brother begins to withdraw and act out and her father's anger swells. As the pressures of assimilation compound and the fissures within her family deepen into fractures, Queenie is left suspended between two countries, two identities, and two parents. This is a book that absolutely seems right up Book of the Month Alley. First of all, it is a debut and it follows immigrants from the Philippines as they are struggling with assimilation into the United States. It says it's a novel about intergenerational fractures and coming of age following a young woman who immigrates to the United States from the Philippines and finds herself adrift between familial expectations and her own burning desires. So it sounds like maybe our main character is desiring to assimilate. Like she really wants to be American. At, at the very least, she wants to go to college and she has all of these big dreams for herself, but her family is struggling and her family is fracturing under all of these expectations. So that definitely sounds very harrowing, very hard hitting. It sounds like something I would very much enjoy reading about. And it's another look on immigration in the United States and our expectations of people who immigrate to this country and things like that. This is certainly a very top contender for this category, in my opinion. This next one is actually coming out at the very end of October. It is coming out on the 29th. So this has just as much likelihood of being featured in October as it does in November. But of course, as I only talk about the books within the month that they come out, I have to mention it here. But the book is called This Motherless Land by Nikki May. It says, Quiet Funk is happy in Nigeria. She loves her art teacher mother, her professor father, and even her annoying little brother. But when tragedy strikes, she's sent to England, a place she knows only from her mother's stories. To her dismay, she finds the much lauded estate dilapidated, the food tasteless, the weather gray. Worse still, her mother's family are cold and distant, with one exception, her cousin Liv. Free-spirited Liv has always wanted to break free of her joyless family. She becomes fiercely protective of her little cousin, and her warmth and kindness give her cousin a place to heal. The two girls grow into adulthood, the closest of friends. But the choices their mothers made haunt both of them, and when a second tragedy occurs, their friendship is torn apart. Against the long shadow of their shared family history, each woman will struggle to chart a path forward, separated by country, misunderstanding,
understandings and ambition. Separated between Somerset and Lagos over the course of two decades, this motherless land is a sweeping examination of identity, culture, race, and love that asks how we find belonging and whether a family's generational wrongs can be righted. Okay, so yet again, we have another deeply cultural novel. We have a main character who's been uprooted from Nigeria. She has to move to England and all that comes along with it. It sounds like there's also some intergenerational trauma going on there, but it's also about her budding relationship with her cousin in England and some things that might get between that friendship and all the things that they have to come to terms with. So again, another very character-driven, harder-hitting literary fiction novel that is certainly on my radar. And again, this is certainly one that I believe is a top contender for Book of the Month in this category. And the last one that I have for this category is yet another one that comes out on October 9th. It is called Like Mother, Like Mother from Susan Rieger. It says, Detroit 1960, Lila Pereira is two years old when her angry abusive father has her mother committed to an asylum. Lila never sees her mother again. Three decades later, having mustered everything she has, brains, charms, talent, blonde hair, Lila rises to the pinnacle of American media as the powerful, brilliant executive editor of the Washington Globe. Lila unapologetically prioritizes her career, leaving the rearing of her daughters to her generous husband, Joe. He doesn't mind until he does. But Grace, their youngest daughter, feels abandoned. She wishes her mother would attend PTA meetings, not White House correspondence dinners. As she grows up, she cannot shake her resentment. She wants out from under Lila's shadow, yet the more she resists, the more Lila seems to shape her life. Grace becomes a successful reporter, even publishing a best-selling book about her mother. In the process of writing it, she realizes how little she knows about her own family. Did Lila's mother, Grace's grandmother, die in that asylum? Is refusal to look back the only way to create a future? How can you ever be yourself, Grace wonders, if you don't know where you came from? Spanning generations and populated by complex, unforgettable characters, like Mother Like Mother is an exhilarating portrait of family, marriage, ambition, power, the stories we inherit, and the lies we tell to become the people we believe we're meant to be. So that actually sounds really phenomenal. That sounds certainly like something that is up my alley because again, very, very character driven. You have a complex mother daughter dynamic going on in here. And I would like to explore that further. I would really like to know what happened to this woman in the asylum. And I would really like to see what happens with Lila and her daughter Grace and how they kind of come together and how they overcome all of the complications and their relationship and their family. So this is absolutely one that I'm putting on my radar because it sounds certainly like a book that I could enjoy. Moving on into the historical fiction category, I just have a couple to talk to you about. The first is called The Fabled Earth by Kim Kimberly Brock. This says 1932. Cumberland Island off the coast of southern Georgia is a strange place to encounter the opulence of the Gilded Age. The last vestige of the famed philanthropic Carnegie family still take up brief seasonal residence in their grand mansions there. This year's party at Plum Orchard is a lively group. Young men from some of America's finest families who come to experience the area's hunting besides a local guide. A beautiful debutante expecting to be engaged by the week's end. And a promising female artist who believes she has meaningful ties to her wealthy hosts. But when the temptations arise and passions flare, an evening of revelry and storytelling goes horribly awry lives are both lost and ruined. 1959. Reclusive painter Cleo Woodbine has lived alone for decades on Kingdom Come, a tiny strip of land once occupied by the servants for the great house on nearby Cumberland. When she is visited by the man who saved her life nearly 30 years earlier, a tempest is unleashed as the stories of the past gather and begin to regain their strength. Frances Flood is a folklorist come to Cumberland Island seeking the source of a legend and also information about her mother who was among the guests at a long ago hunting party. Audrey Howell, briefly a newlywed and now newly widowed, is running a local inn. When she develops an eerie double exposure photograph, some believe she's raised a ghost, someone who hasn't been seen since that fateful night in 1932. Southern mythology and personal reckoning collide in the sweeping story inspired by little known history of Cumberland Island where a once in a century storm threatens the natural landscape. Faced with a changing world, two timelines and the perspectives of three women intersect where a folktale meets the truth to reveal what Cumberland Island has hidden all along. So that actually sounds like it's going to be really, really atmospheric. Okay, first of all, it's set in the South. It's actually set on an island. Sounds like there was a night back in the 1930s where something went terribly wrong at a hunting party and somebody was never seen again. And now it's almost 30 years later and it sounds like some of that truth is going to come to light. This is honestly giving me very Diane Chamberlain vibes and I am intrigued. I've never heard of this author. I do not know if she's a debut or not. If she is not and you have read her, please let me know because I'm very, very interested in this one. All right, and the last one for this category is a book called Daughter of Ruins by Yvette Manessis Corporon. Demetra's mother died in America in the 1930s when Demetra was three years old. Her father took her home to the Greek island of Cephalonia where she endures a lonely childhood and dreams her dead mother watches over her, like the goddesses she reads about in her mythology books. When Demetra comes of age, she refuses to marry the man chosen for her. Instead, she defiantly begins an affair with a forbidden man who ignites her passion for painting the goddesses she once imagined protected her. Elena is a beautiful Italian woman who dreamed of a life away from the brothels where she was raised. But opportunities are not meant for daughters of prostitutes, and Elena has no choice but to become one herself. When Italy occupies Cephalonia, Elena finds work entertaining the soldiers. Her life on the island is happy and carefree until the Germans arrive in 1943. Maria lives in a poor mountain village in 1921 with a loving mother and sister. When her father grows desperate to feed his family, he sends her to America as a picture bride to marry a stranger. Only 18 years old, Maria is terrified of the journey ahead. Daughter 
of Ruins is an all-encompassing tale steeped in the rich history, culture, and myths of Greece. It is a deeply moving story that follows three women as they struggle to control their destinies, fighting to become the women they were meant to be. So offhand, I'm not entirely sure how all of these perspectives are going to connect, if they even do, and what the purpose behind them are, but I definitely do think that this is a story that Book of the Month is highly likely to feature, so I wanted to mention it here. All right, and we've made it to the final category, which is sci-fi fantasy and magical realism, and the very first book I want to mention in this category is a book called The Witches of El Paso by Luis Aramillo. 1943 El Paso, Texas. Teenager Nina spends her days caring for the small children of her older sisters while longing for a life of freedom and adventure. The premonitions and fainting spells she has endured since childhood are getting worse and Nina worries she'll end up like the scary old curandera down the street. Nina prays for help and when the mysterious sister Benedicta arrives late one night, Nina follows her across the border of space and time. In colonial Mexico, Nina grows into her power, finding love and learning that magic always comes with a price. In the present day, Nina's grandniece Marta balances a struggling legal aid practice with motherhood and the care of the now 93 year old Nina. When Marta agrees to help search for a daughter Nina left in the past, the two forge a fierce connection. Marta's own supernatural powers emerge, awakening her to new possibilities that threaten the life she has constructed. Okay, so that actually sounds really, really interesting. It sounds like there's going to be a little bit of time travel in this. It sounds also like it's going to be very atmospheric and again, very, very witchy. So this could potentially be the perfect October read. Next, I have a book called The City in Glass by Nevo. Now, I do believe that Nevo has been featured on Book of the Month in the past, which again, makes her a strong contender to be featured once again. This says, The demon Vitrine, immortal, powerful, and capricious, loves the dazzling city of Azrael. She has mothered, married, and maddened the city and its people for generations and built it into a place of joy and desire, revelry and riot. And then the angels come and the city falls. Vitrine is left with nothing but memories and a book containing the names of those she lost and an angel now bound by her mad grief-stricken curse to haunt the city he burned. She mourns her dead and rages against the angel she longs to destroy. Made to be each other's devastation, angel and demon are destined for eternal battle. Instead, they find themselves locked in a devouring fascination that will change them both forever. Together, they unearth the past of the lost city and begin to shape its future. But when war threatens Azrael and everything they have built, Vitrine and her angel must decide whether they will let the city fall again. The City in Glass is both a brilliantly constructed history and an epic love story of death and resurrection, memory and transformation, redemption and desire, strong enough to reduce the world to ashes and remake it anew. I have never actually read anything by Nevo, but I've heard amazing things, and this one definitely sounds interesting for sure, so be on the lookout for this one. And the very last one that I have for this category is a book called The Dagger and the Flame by Catherine Doyle. It says, In Phantome, a kingdom of cobbled streets, flickering lamplight, beautiful buildings, and secret catacombs, shade magic is a scarce and deadly commodity controlled by two enemy guilds, the cloaks and the daggers, the thieves and the assassins. On the night of her mother's murder, 18-year-old Seraphine runs for her life, seeking sanctuary with the cloaks. Sarah's heart is set on revenge, but are her secret abilities a match for the dark-haired boy whose quick silver eyes follow her around the city? Nothing can prepare Sarah for the moment she finally comes face to face with Ransom, heir to the Order of Daggers, and Ransom is shocked to discover that this unassuming farm girl wields a strange and blazing magic he has never seen before. As the cloaks and the daggers grapple for control of Phantom's underworld, Sarah and Ransom are consumed by the push and pull of their magic and the deadly spark and terrible vengeance that keeps drawing them back together. So I don't necessarily know if this is supposed to be young adult. It sounds like it follows 18 year old main characters. So it definitely could be adult, new adult. And it sounds like it could be a little bit of enemies to lovers or rivals to lovers as you have a main character who is seeking sanctuary with the cloaks, but then she comes face to face with the heir to the order of the daggers. So this definitely sounds like there could be a little bit of a romance involved there. And we all know that romance C is currently very, very big. So I certainly would not be surprised to see Book of the Month feature this, especially after they featured, I think it was like Phantasma for the month of September. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are the books that I feel could potentially be featured in October, either as curated monthly selections or as add-on selections for Book of the Month. I did want to mention really quickly that as of the filming of this video, Book of the Month has announced an add-on that is currently available to add to your box, and that is the newest release from Richard Osman called We Solve Murders. So that is already there and available if you are interested in that one. As always, y'all, I would love to know if there are any other books that you feel could be potential contenders for Book of the Month, either as monthly curated selections or as add-on selections, or if any of these are striking your fancy, or if you feel like October could be a skip month for you, I would love to know. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me some type of ocean emoji down in the comments below. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books featured in the video. Until next time, y'all.